Hi boys and girls, welcome back. Today we're reading Sticks and Stones, illustrated and written by Patricia Palaco. But before we begin, we're gonna start with our riddle. You ready? What's brown and sticky? Think about it. Let's go. Sticks and Stones by Patricia Palaco. It was almost fall. I had spent my summer with my dad and grandma. As always, I would normally get ready to fly back to California to be with my mother and go back to school. But this summer, it was decided by my parents that I could stay in Michigan for the school year. I had always wanted to spend a winter with my dad, and I couldn't believe my luck. Maybe at this school I'd be popular and no one would know that reading was so hard for me. My best summer friends, Helen and Marty, seemed to be so happy that I'd be going to school with them. When my first day of school came, I broke into a red rash all over my face. Of all the times to have my face full of big red blotches, Marty and Helen stopped to pick me up to walk me to school. The three of us had ridden our horses together all summer. I felt so happy knowing they were, going, they were my good friends. But when we got to the entrance of William, Williamston School, they ran squealing to another group of girls. They all stunned me. They just left me standing there alone. I didn't even know where my classroom was. Then a gawky looking boy with dark rimmed glasses, so thick it made his eyes look as big as saucers, loomed, looked over my at my schedule card. Hey, it looks like your first class is with Mrs. Geards. I'm going there too. I'll show you where it is, he said as he tugged at my dress. We entered the art room. Most of the tables were taken. The only one left had a very shy looking girl sitting alone. The boy with the glasses and I started to sit with her. Then a voice boomed out. Well, looky here, sissy boy. And who's the cootie with him? I looked around to see who we met. Then I realized he was pointing at me. Those are cooties on your face, aren't they? And all the kids laughed and I felt my face get real hot. And looked at the boy. And look who sissy boy and cootie are sitting with. Her ugliness. The mean boy trumpeted as he pointed at the shy girl at our table. The name's Tom, not Tommy, just plain Tom. Tom spelled it with an H. Who ignored the mean boy who was glowering at us? She's Raven, Tom motioned to the shy girl. We're no one here as sissy boy and her ugliness. At your service, he chirped and gave a sweeping bow. Looks like we're all in Mrs. Penderson, Peterson's glass together too, he added and scanned my schedule card. My name's Trish. I've lettered my eyelashes, otherwise known as Cootie. Cootie. Then we all giggled. The toad's name is Billy, Tom whispered. We all crouched down and took a fleeting glance at him. He was giving us dirty looks. During the next days, Ravan and I became inseparable. I found out that Ravan designed her own textiles and painted them herself. I told them I could... I told him I had two loves, horses and ballet. My mom had me take ballet lessons back in California almost every day. But here in Michigan, my dad couldn't afford them. I didn't exactly know what Tom liked to do outside of school. I just knew that his mother took him somewhere on Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Fridays and some Saturdays. I didn't know exactly why he was called a sissy boy until one day on the playground when a gym teacher asked us to form teams for a game of softball. He picked two kids to be captain, and the captains picked their team. Even Ravan and I got picked. But Tom just stood there unpicked. Someone pick Tom or I'll sign him to a team, the teacher snapped. Pick him, Strut, Cedric, I whispered to our captain. Please pick him, I added. Oh, all right, Cedric added with a breathy sigh. But he can't play, some of the other kids whined. He can't even throw a ball. As the game started, I saw what they meant. Not only did time Tom strike out in the last inning and lose the game for us, but on the third swing of the ball, the bat flew out of his hands and almost hit the shortstop. For the rest of the day, kids passed us in the hall. Sissy boy! At Tom, as usual, he appeared to laugh it off. But after school, Billy caught up to us as we were walking home. I hear you lost your game. You even lost the bat, he held. Then he thrust his face into Tom's and bared his teeth. Once a sissy, always a sissy. Tom had to be hurting inside, and it broke my heart. 
I felt my face get real hot. It's only a game, I blurted out. At least he isn't an overstuffed bully like you, I added. And remember, sticks and stones can break bones, but names will never hurt you. The outburst earned me a month's worth of elbow jabs in the hall from Billy and his lackeys. <clears throat> the fall air was crisp and foretold the approach of winter snowfall. The winds blew in from the north. It was a Saturday, and Tom had invited Ravan and me over to his farm. He lived in a big old farmhouse on top of a hill. It was the fame, same farmhouse that my mom and dad had lived in when they were first married. My pa parents were now divorced, and so were Tom's. As I walked up the steep drive, I could see him and Ravan out in a field on the side of the house. When I caught up to them, they were both holding the most beautiful kites I had ever seen. Ravan made them, Tom crowed as he grinned. I've never seen anything like these, Ravan, I said to her. She smiled and looked at the ground blushing. She made them out of silk and hand-painted them. Here's yours, Tom said, as he put the most beautiful one in my hands. Let's make them fly, Tom sang out as he ran, trying to catch the wind in his kite. We all ran with our kites until the wind, they caught the wind. The kites rose the strings in our spindles, making a whirring sound. When we pulled on the kites, they darted higher. When we relaxed the string, they dove and circled. Then Tom started running around the pasture with his kites, skimming the tall grass. It was almost as if he were flying. Later, we staked the kites and lay in the tall grass and watched them soar. Ravan hardly ever spoke, but when she did, she always said something that came from deep inside. Cumulus clowns, above all, made shapes, and we called out to one another. A ship, a four-masted schooner, I called out. On a tossing sea, Ravan said quietly. People on deck, Tom said. We watched the ship sail across the sky through our glorious kites, with their streamers moving like jellyfish in the sea. Those people, they're best friends, just like us, Tom said. I wonder where they're going, amused. Who cares? They're together, that's all that count, Tom said, and we clasped hands. Most of the leaves of fall had fallen. Nights were getting colder, and the scent of coming snow was in the wind. Halloween night was, had arrived. It was Thursday, but Tom was home. He invited Ravan and me over to his house to start our trick-or-treating there. He wouldn't tell us what he was going to be. It was the first time I had ever been inside his house. I kept thinking that something should be familiar to me, but it wasn't. Come on, Tom, call from the top of the stairs. Ravan and I rushed up. So this is your room, I almost said in a whisper. Since we used to live there when we, I was little, I wondered if it had been my room once. The walls were covered with posters from ballet companies all over the world. In his bookcases were magazines that I recognized as the kind sold at ballerina performances. I picked one up. This is Sadler's well, ba Wells Ballet from England. I have one just like it, I said. My mother had taken me to Sadler's Wells Ballet in San Francisco when I was only eight. Tom pointed out, look, there's Margot Fonterin and Moira Shearer. They are the finest dancers in the world. Moira Shearer was in my favorite movie. The, I started, the red shoes, Tom finished my sentence. Suddenly I knew where Tom went on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and every Saturday. Do you dance, Tom? Do you take ballet? I said as I touched his hand. He looked intently at me for a minute, then he leapt right into the air and pulled his toes into perfect points. Ravain smiled. She had known all along. I thought it was wonderful. But I wondered what Billy would do if he, or say if he knew. It was getting dark outside, and it was time to dress for Halloween. I wore an old suit of my dad's and made my face to look like a hobo. When Ravan put on a flowing dress of silk she had sewn and hand-painted, I couldn't believe my eyes. When she pulled back her hair and clipped it, she was beautiful. Then Tom walked in. In the middle of a wicker basket, he had the holes for legs and wrinkled clothes hanging out. I'm dirty laundry, he chirped and danced across the room. Every house we went to, people oohed and nodded at Ravan's dress. They liked my costume, but everyone thought Tom was the most original and funniest they had ever seen. After a while, we collected so much candy we could carry, we started home, laughing and teasing one another about who had the most candy. 
We were almost to Tom's when Billy and his toadies jumped out from behind Mrs. Adams' old fort. Hey, look, sissy boy, her ugliness and cootie, he sneered. We tried to walk by him, but he blocked our way. Then he and the others grabbed our bags of candy. Thank you, sissy, Billy oozed, and he gave Tom a big shove. Tom just stood there. I said, thank you, sissy, he shoved him again. Still, Tom didn't move. I didn't know where my voice came from, but I found myself screaming at Billy. Leave him alone, you big Billy, bully. Pick on someone your own size. Billy's little beady eyes drilled holes through me when the light flicked on in Mrs. Adams' porch. He sneered at me one last time and ran away. I just knew that Tom was really going to be in for it now. The Christmas holidays went by as they should. I don't think I shall ever forget the evening when Tom and his mother took Ravana me to see the Nutcracker Ballet at Lansing. The four of us sat huddled. I looked at Tom's face from time to time. His face was full of wonder with the mice dancing and fighting and wooden soldiers. And when the sugar plum fairy danced in the line across the stage, I don't think I'd ever seen pure rapture in someone's eyes until then. In February, when the Valentine's box was open and Valentine's were handed out to every class, kid in class, Tom only got two, one from Ravan and me. What, he whispered to me? No Valentine from Billy? He grinned, that was Tom turning a bad situation into an okay one. How I admired him. It was a cold winter and the whole school was a buzz about the production put on at the end of every year, the talent show. Just to want about everyone put together some sort of act, dancers, singers, yodlers, tumblers. The show was so big, even parents came. But we liked to sit in the bleachers in the gym of the school and watch the kids practice. Tom always had something encouraging to say to almost every kid that performed. Good job, Cheryl, he said after she tapped dance. Hey, Danny, you nailed the balance beam. See what ballet can do for you, Tom sang out as he landed. It was then we realized that Billy and the coach had not left the room. They both heard what Tom had said. Ballet or not? Ballet? Ballet or not? kid. Why haven't you tried out for the team? The coach asked Billy. Billy's fists were white from squeezing so hard. Tom's face was red. I was just fooling around, he stammered. He grabbed his books and made for the other door. The coach kept trying to call after him, but Tom didn't turn back. We were almost home when Billy suddenly straddled the sidewalk in front of us. He was alone this time. He jumped Tom, pushed him to the ground so hard that his glasses flew up. My glasses, I can't see without my glasses, Tom pleaded. Billy picked them up and held them in front of his face. You mean these, you little pris, you butterfly ballet dancer, Billy said, Billy said in a mocking, whiny voice. Wait until I tell everyone at school. Please, my glasses, I need them, Tom begged. They're the only ones I have. With that, Billy dropped them and stepped on them, grinding them into the ground. Then he laughed and ran away. For the first time, I saw Tom cry. He sat down on the curb and tears ran down his face. Mom won't be able to get me new glasses for a long time. She just can't. They're so expensive. Ravan and I sat with Tom, not knowing what to say. Suddenly, his face changed. I didn't realize how handsome he was without his glasses. He had beautiful dark eyes. I'm going to be in the talent show, Tom said with resolve. Will you dance, I asked. Tom wiped the tears out of his own eyes. Yes, he said. Yes, I'm going to dance. As the days passed, Tom practiced and practiced the dance he had danced in a performance a year before. Tom's mother taped his glasses so he couldn't, but he couldn't dance in them very well. So Ravan and I helped him to block out the space on stage because he couldn't see well enough to be sure where he was stepping. When the big day arrived, Ravan and I helped him into his costume in a closet so that no one would see him until he stepped on stage. I just stood in front of the stage of the gym floor so I could see him in case he was too close to the edge. I gave the record to the person who was going to be turn, turn on the phonograph for Tom's dance. Finally, there was a hush. The annual spring program commenced with Frida Harding's tap dance. 
Then Jesse David DeWitt did bird calls, and the girls' glee club sang three selections from Oklahoma. The principal made a boring speech, which was followed by two really dumb skits by the Boys Athletic Club. Just before Tom, the pom-pom girls did a routine called Razzle Dazzle. Then it was time. Tom was on. The empty stage was dimly lit, except for the one spotlight in the middle of the backdrop, where Van cued the music. First, they missed the track, and there was a loud scratching sound. The melody from the ballet, Swan Lake, echoed from the wings. Tom stepped into the spotlight. He was dressed in all white. In the classic costume of the Prince Siegfried from Swan Lake, he seemed to be glowing. Then Billy jumped up on a seat and called out, It's Sissy Boy! A girl shrieked and some of the boys gave catcalls. And finally the laughter resounded into what seemed like a hundred students stomping their feet on the gym floor. Tom began to dance anyways. The laughter was so loud that the record could barely, hardly be heard. But Tom danced, perfect pirouettes, spinning like a top. He was so graceful and elegant. He was the swan prince. Someone reached in and took off the music, but Tom didn't stop. He didn't even need the music. His leaps were high and powerful, athletic. At times, he looked as if he were suspended on a wire. Tom kept dancing. The catcalls and laughter, jeering, started to die down. Tom kept dancing. He leapt and turned, making sweeping steps across the stage. Finally, there was complete silence. All of that could be heard with the shuffle and thumps of Tom's feet landing on the wooden stage. Then, before it was over, there was a sound of a single person clapping, then another. The room exploded. The thunder of clapping moved on in a huge wave toward the stage. Tom finished his dance with a grand leap, landing in the center of the stage. Then he bowed. One by one, kids rose to their feet, clapping and cheering. Soon the entire auditorium was standing. The sound of their whistles was cheers was deafening. Tom received a standing ovation that lasted a full four minutes. I counted. When I gave him his glasses, his mother had taped together. Tears rolled down my face. Tom, I've never seen so anything, something so brave in my life, I sobbed. I was worried when you said you were going to dance today, but you showed them, you showed them, and they loved you too. No one ever laughed at him again. And the, the only name they knew him by was Tom, not Tommy, not Tom, T-H-O-M, Tom. I returned to California after that summer and resumed my schooling in my own ballet classes. Every summer when I returned to Williamston to see Dad, I always made time to see Tom and Ravan, and they made time for me. The last the three of us were together was the summer of our 18th birthday. At the end of the summer, just before we left, we all stood on that windy hill above Tom's house. I was set to go to art school in the fall. It turned out I did that better than ballet. Ravan was going to apprentice with the dressmaker in Chicago. Tom had been accepted into New York Ballet School. We clasped hands. We didn't say anything. There was no need. We knew that moment would be in our hearts as long as we lived. That's, the end. That's a beautiful story about someone not being afraid to be who they are. I love it. Now, for our riddle. What's brown and sticky? A stick. Get it? Sticks and stones. I miss you. I love you. I'll see you soon. Bye, boys and girls.